So let's be honest with ourselves. As much as I love the Pixel series, they've always struggled to become a big competitor to the brands such as iPhones and Galaxies and have always had some big issue that prevented them from being accessible to even the most average consumer. But this year, it looks like Google tried to step it up and they went for the gold. And I got some thoughts on how they pulled it off. Let's jump in with my one month review, the Pixel 6 Pro. Now, of course, before we get into it, I'm gonna need you guys to hit that like and subscribe button. And please hit that bell icon if you wanna make sure you're up to date on when I drop new videos. Of course, I love to see you guys comment and let me know what you think about this phone and what you think about this review. One big spot Google always struggled with was with design. Not that it was always bad per se, but it failed to have an iconic look that appealed to the masses, as well as they failed to have a consistent look that made you know whenever you see it, oh, this is the Pixel. This year, they definitely stepped it up. Now, we're gonna jump into the back of this phone, because that's the most noticeable thing, especially this large camera visor. Now, I'm a big fan of it, but I wasn't always so intrigued with it. But now that I got it in hand, I love it. It stands out, and when people see it, they ask me like, hey, is that the new Pixel phone? And that's a big win for Google, and that's something they want to happen. You also get this nice two-tone back. As you can see, I have the cloudy white. Now, my biggest problem with this back is the fact that it's extremely glossy, which means you will see fingerprints. I have noticed that the lighter colors, such as the white and the sunny, are much better at preventing fingerprints from showing up. But that black one, it's a fingerprint magnet, and you gotta be careful with it. On the Pro Series, you also get this nice, shiny aluminum rail, which I gotta admit, I was worried it was gonna be as fingerprint heavy as, let's say, the iPhone 13 Pro, but it does a good job of not really showing those fingerprints. I do prefer the matte black side rails of the Pixel 6, but it looks good here. I'm, I'm a fan, I like it. I do wish they would've kept the frosted back that we've seen on the Pixel 3 and Pixel 4, but hey, still looks good, and if you get a light color, you'll be okay. Now, that doesn't mean the back design is perfect. It is missing a little bit of polish that you would see on some more mature devices, such as the Galaxy S21. You see, the Galaxy series, the way the aluminum rails blended in with the camera bump, is seamless and looks great. On the Pixel, it looks decent, but there are some rough edges, and I'm hoping that in the future, it looks a lot better. And I think it will be, because this is their first step into having a fully flagship device, and for their first go at it, it's really good. But like I said, just a little more polish, and the competition will have to step it up. I will say though, it is a large phone, 6.7 inches. It's somewhere along the size of a Galaxy Note 21, but it is a nice thin design, and with that slight curve on the back and the front, it feels easy in hand, at least for me. I do have larger hands, so I don't have some of the issues that other people do. You know, some people say it's very slippery in hand. I don't get that. It's slippery when you put it on a desk. You're going to want a case. But the camera bump does help when it comes to carrying it because my finger tends to rest right underneath it. And I like it. I, I feel comfortable enough to hold this without a case, but I'm not going to, not yet. You know me, I hate having cases on my phones for too long. This one I have to get used to before I start risking it. If that size is too large for you, I gotta admit the Pixel 6 is still kind of big, but definitely more manageable at 6.4 inches. Plus it has matte rails and a flat front, so probably easier for the average person to grip and hold on to. If you got a problem or have tiny hands, you should probably jump into that one. All right, so we know that the back of the phone is generally a winner, how about the front? I gotta say, I am loving the display on this phone. It comes with a 120 hertz LTPO screen at Quad HD. It has some beautiful color calibration. Even when you leave it on the default adaptive display, it's beautiful. It knows when you're looking at an image that will look better with a more natural tone or when you're watching something like anime, it will kind of bump up the saturation a bit, but not too much the way the Galaxy does. 
the viewing experience has been phenomenal for me. When I'm watching anime or Netflix or any great show, the colors pop, it's smooth, it's what I like. Also, this is one of the few Pixel phones where the brightness is not an issue. I think they said it only caps at like 500 nits peak and then 800 if you have HDR. It feels brighter than that because I haven't had any issues using this in direct sunlight. And I live in Florida where it gets pretty bright. So I haven't wanted this to be brighter than it gets. That's a first for me with Pixel devices. So kudos to Google, they stepped it up this year. Now that 120 Hertz LTPO display, as good as it is and as smooth as it is, there is a slight issue. You see, it's supposed to drop down to about 10 Hertz depending on what you're looking at. So if I'm looking at a picture, it's gonna drop down help save battery. I put this in its developer options and was showing my frame rate just to test it out. And for some reason, it doesn't seem to really go below 60. In fact, it primarily kept going from 120 to 60 Hertz. I don't know if it's a bug on the LTPO display or maybe a bug on developer options not showing the proper Hertz or refresh rate. But if there is a problem, Google needs to fix that because that could cause battery issues if it's not dropping down as low as Google promised. Now speaking of that battery, once again, not everything is perfect with this device. The biggest issue I have with the battery has been it's inconsistent. For one, it really depends on if you're on Wi-Fi or 5G LTE. I've noticed a lot of other users have complained about the battery life and other ones have praised it. So it's different across the board, across different devices. In my testing, I've seen that on Wi-Fi, I can average around seven hours screen on time. That's gaming, YouTube, Twitter, all the basic usage. I don't really think about my battery life until I hit that 5G or LTE. That seems to be a big, big power draw for these phones. So I don't know which antenna Google decided to use for the Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro, but next year, maybe they should probably go back to Qualcomm because it is not doing the job that it's supposed to. Other than that, yeah, it's it's fine. It's not uh, like four hour battery as opposed to what some people may say. I generally get a whole day's worth. And even if it dies in the middle of the day, going from close to zero to 50% is super quick at 30 minutes. But that opens up the door to another problem with the Pixel battery, it's charging speeds. Granted, Google never said they do 30 watt charging, but they did advertise a 30 watt charger, giving us the impression that it was really fast charging for a Pixel device. That's not so true. You see, the Pixel charges at around 22, 23 watts, and it only does that when you're going from zero to 50%. That aspect is really fast, but after the 50% juice, it slows down immensely. God forbid you're at 90, you want to get the 100, that thing, man, it takes like 20 minutes. <laughs> I don't know why they slow it down. Well, I know why they slow it down. I'm going to get into that. But we would have liked to see really fast charging. I was thinking about this and kind of going over some of the other competitors, and I noticed that Apple and Google, they don't care about fast charging the way Oppo or OnePlus or even Samsung does. What they care about is battery longevity. So rather than just giving you super fast charging that may harm your battery in the long run, they'd rather give you more moderate speeds. But that way your battery lives longer, which means you could hold on to your phone longer. So not as fun, not as fast as these ultra fast chargers we get on other devices, but definitely more reliable and probably more valuable in the long run when it comes to keeping your device healthy. So. I don't really have a great way of describing how well Google's brand new Tensor chip works. The best way I can describe it is I don't notice it. And I mean that in an absolutely positive way. You see, compared to the Samsungs and the iPhones and the Galaxies and the OnePluses using the latest and greatest chips, this guy keeps up. I know benchmarks didn't seem that impressive, but using it daily, I had no hiccups, no slowdowns, it was fast, smooth along with Android 12's rework of the framework when it comes to the animations and how Android runs, 
it is a buttery smooth experience. No concerns, no issues. If you want a fast device, you got one. And I'm very impressed with this being Google's first outing with their own custom chip. Now, the only part of the performance that does worry me is sometimes it gets a little warm. TikTok is a big cause of heat and some gaming. Now, that's normal for gaming, but it's a concern. And sometimes I'm just using it on the 5G LTE and I can feel the phone get warm. Nothing to be concerned about, nothing that makes me feel like I have to turn my phone off before it blows up. But I do notice heat, and if you want to think about that battery life, a warm phone drains battery even quicker. Let's get back to the gaming. Gaming on this device, fantastic. I've played Call of Duty Mobile, Asphalt 9. I tried Genshin Impact a little bit, and that was the only game that had a little bit of issues. And I'm wondering if it's more or less just needing to be updated to deal with Google's Tensor chip. Gaming, fine. Once again, gets warm, but that's normal. I've had that on almost every phone I've played on. Haven't noticed any type of throttling really, or frame dips. It can handle whatever game I seem to throw at it. Some better than others, obviously. But still, really good. I think most people will be impressed with how the Google Tensor chip performs. But that's just on the speed level. Where the Google Tensor chip really shines is its AI processing and computing. For one, we see improvements in processing speeds for its HDR technology with the camera. Where I've used it the most is probably voice to text. Man, I tell you, it is incredible how fast and how precise it is when it comes to catching my voice and translating it to text. To give you an example, this entire review was scripted using just my voice. And I haven't had to change much Definitely didn't have to change punctuation, maybe fix a word or two that it may have heard incorrectly, but this is really impressive stuff and will change how people utilize their phone. Now you're also gonna notice improvements in the adaptive battery, adaptive display, things where Google learns how we use it, you're gonna see great things with. Programs such as the magic eraser in the camera that I'm gonna talk about a little later on, probably won't be as good as they are without that Google Tensor chip. This being their first iteration, I'm excited to see what Google does when they improve on it. So kudos to Google, Tensor seems to be a go. Now, I mentioned that camera. How does the camera work out? Really, really good. But there is some weird concerns, and I think it's more software-based rather than hardware-based. Why? Well, Google finally updated their camera hardware to a 50 megapixel main shooter. They still have their 12 megapixel ultra-wide, and a four times telephoto lens. Let's move back to that main sensor. You're gonna get a lot of light. You're gonna get a nice natural bokeh effect. You know, that blurred background when you take a snapshot of somebody. But I've gotten some great pictures without having to move over to portrait mode just because of how much the camera has improved. The depth of field with these cameras, fantastic. Where it does kind of mess up is when it seems to forget that it has better hardware. I feel like Google is still pretty aggressive with their HDR and their sharpening and contrast as if they were still using an older 12 megapixel lens. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes you'll gather images that just seem to be a little overprocessed. That's a small price to pay when you think about some of the benefits. My favorite being its quick shutter speed. Now, you know, with my Galaxy S21, that was one of the things I complained about. This phone is one of the fastest snappers I have, especially when you add it to the D-Blur. Like I always say, my daughter loves to run around and this guy catches her nine times out of 10. It's amazing. Outdoor shots are beautiful. Nighttime shots, even without using the night sight mode, are great. Turn on that night sight mode and it's even better. Although, once again, Google is still trying to make up for the hardware they had on their previous phone. So sometimes that exposure shot can get a little blurry because you're holding it for a little too long as if they still had their 12 megapixel camera. So these problems aren't too major because they can be fixed with software updates. When it comes to the hardware, fantastic. When it comes to software, once again, Google just has to learn that they are using new hardware. They don't need to go as hard as they were before. The telephoto lens has been fantastic. Even when you take far away shots, it comes out looking pretty crisp and clean and usable. 
Obviously that's because of the super res zoom mixed with the hardware benefits of having a four times telephoto lens. So I have no complaints there. Obviously the further you go, the more mushier the image gets, but regular usage, definitely surprising. I like how it came out. And I'm having fun using telephoto more than I thought I would. The ultra wide has to be the weakest point. It's not that it's bad. It's not that much of a change from the main lens when you look at the field of view. It's not super wide, but it does a good job of avoiding that distortion that you do get with a lot of other wide angle lenses, which is good and bad because sometimes that distortion can make ultra wide shots have a little bit more personality and a little more life to them. But hey, in everyday usage, not bad. The front facing camera, hit or miss. Low light situations, it seems to fall apart, but every other day, every other situation, every other lighting, seems to work pretty well. I've gotten some great shots out of it and some bad shots out of it. So that's the one that's more hit or miss. Not so bad that it's unusable. You'll still get some pretty good shots using the front facing camera. Well, how about video? We all know Google failed video for every iteration of the device. This one, definitely an improvement. Now, it's not iPhone 13 quality. There's no cool cinematic mode. It's a pretty bare bones video camera with a few neat features, such as their cinematic pan and stabilization modes. But just taking a quick shot and looking at it, it's clean, goes up to 4K 60. HDR brings in a little bit more detail, great dynamic range. It's just not anything particularly outstanding, but it is good. So if you're looking for the top video shooter on a mobile device, you might want to stick with iOS. And if you're like, I don't want iOS, probably go Samsung. If you hate Samsung, you're not going to be disappointed with this. You're just not going to be as impressed as the other two guys. But along with the camera features, you get some cool things like Magic Eraser that uses AI to kind of pick out people in the background or objects in the background that you may not want in your shots and actually remove them. And it does a pretty good job. Now, sometimes it goes a little crazy, but for the most part, it's really good. And I'm not gonna go and say that Google was the first one to do it. Samsung actually had it in their devices. But here's the big difference. You see, Samsung had a bad habit of creating it, not talking about it, and then hiding it in experimental lab options. So. I give credit to Google because they showed it up front and wanted people to use it. They didn't treat it like, like, like something they're ashamed of. So I'm sorry, Samsung Knights, y'all can't use that one. But I don't want to be a fanboy about this device. There are some things that generally were pretty bad and are still pretty bad. Number one, the fingerprint reader. It's finally under display, but it's very slow and it was very unreliable. Thankfully, a little bit before I did this review, they did push out an update that has greatly improved my experience with it. To the point where I'm starting to feel it naturally. Before I was very aware I was using the fingerprint scanner. This time, I can just put my finger down. It still is maybe a second of waiting and it'll click on. Now, I'm spoiled. I came from the Galaxy S21 that had the ultrasonic fingerprint reader and that bad boy was fast, smooth, just flawless. I didn't have to think about it, just tap it, Boom, it worked. The Pixel, not so much. It's getting there, but it's not quite there. Now, another bad aspect of this phone isn't really the Pixel's fault, but more software. And that's Android 12 being as buggy as it is at launch. It still felt like a beta, but typical googly fashion. Every day, there's updates to apps and its software in general that are making the experience much better. For now, my YouTube studio app doesn't crash when I'm trying to reply to guys. And that was a big issue for a lot of content creators. But it's getting better and it's becoming a much more enjoyable experience. Because Android also separates a lot of their apps and updates, you don't have to wait for a full-fledged monthly update to see improvements on these programs. Everything's separated in the Play Store, so sometimes you do get fixes without it being a major update. And that's a beautiful thing about be on stock Android or at least Pixel Launcher. A lot of people also complain about the adaptive brightness, which I think is a bit of a misconception. It's not that it's bad, it just doesn't work like auto brightness. And sometimes it can be a little late to update, but the more you use it, the more it learns. So 
if you are struggling coming from something that uses regular auto brightness, adaptive brightness is a little different. That might be one of those things where we don't need Google's intelligence. We'll be happy with the old way of doing it. But all these issues are pretty minor. And it, that's a first for Google because they tend to have major issues. So this is a big step. And I think this is the first time Google made a phone that the average person can get and not have to worry about something just killing the experience. And I'm excited to see what happens. All right, so let's run this back. Pixel Pro is an amazing device. You get decent battery, you have a wonderful camera, smooth, smooth 120 hertz screen with great software that might be a little buggy. But the biggest selling point, the price. This starts at $899, undercutting all the top flagship level phones, but offering pretty much everything they do. The biggest competitor to the Pixel 6 Pro is its little brother, the regular Pixel 6, that comes in at $599 and all you miss is the telephoto lens, quad HD screen, but because it's smaller at 6.4 inches, the pixel density is still very good. You do get those matte rails and a flat edge screen, which is a benefit for a lot of people. So I'm happy to say that this pixel, I feel comfortable to recommend to everybody. And I think if you were a pixel fan or trying to get away from Samsung or Apple, you owe it to yourself to give this guy a try. Not only that, but you'll be doing yourself a favor and saving a lot of money because you get a great flagship that starts at $599 for the base, $899 for the Pro. Can't get that anywhere else, at least not for a 2021 phone. So I gotta say, Google, you knocked it out the park with this one. Still room for improvement, but when it comes to a flagship level phone, good job. It's not perfect, it's not the best but it's pretty damn good. So once again, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you love about this phone, what you wish was in this phone, or what you wanna see in the next generation Pixel phone. So once again, this is Everyday Tech with Stan JB. Thanks for watching me talk about tech, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.